I'm Corey Astle. And I'm Kyle Salmon. Welcome to Conservative Minds, a podcast dedicated to examining conservative intellectual history to determine the core values of American conservatism. What does it mean to call yourself a conservative? And what did it mean in prior times? And how did we get where we are today? We explore these questions and more by turning to conservative political thinkers from the past and present. Each episode, we select readings and conduct a discussion to share with you our investigation. If you want to join the discussion, like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter at at consminds. That's at C-O-N-S-M-I-N-D-S. For this inaugural episode, we read Conscience of a Conservative by Barry Goldwater from 1960. Specifically, we focus on chapters 1 through 3 and 7 and 8. Barry Goldwater was born in Phoenix in 1909. His father owned the largest department store in the city. While his father was Jewish, his mother was a devout Episcopalian, and Barry served as altar boy at Trinity Cathedral. After flunking two high school courses, his father transferred him to military school in Virginia. He attended the University of Arizona, where he was elected class president and played on the football and basketball teams. But soon after enrolling, his father died of a heart attack, and Barry dropped out of college to return home to run his father's department store. Like many males of his generation, He served in World War II, but due to poor eyesight, he failed flight training and instead served in the Air Transport Command stationed in the Pacific Theater. After returning home from the war, he began his political career by winning a seat on the Phoenix City Council. Although his father was a Democrat, Goldwater ran as a Republican. In 1952, he narrowly defeated sitting U.S. Senator Ernest McFarland. During his first term in the Senate, the Saturday Evening Post described Goldwater as aggressive, articulate, colorful, and having more leadership potential than any other Republican. He became a staunch critic of big government, declaring that any government big enough to give you everything you want is big enough to take away everything you have. Goldwater was unapologetically conservative and driven driven to uphold the Constitution. In 1960, he teamed up with influential conservative writer Brent Bozell to pen his manifesto, The Conscience of a Conservative. It was an original Bible of movement conservatism that mapped out Goldwater's own conservative political philosophy has set the stage for the next 40 years of movement conservatism and has since sold millions of copies. In 1964, he won the Republican nomination for president to run against newly elevated President Lyndon Johnson. At the Republican convention, Goldwater offered his most famous lines. He said, I would remind you that extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. And let me remind you also that moderation in the pursuit of justice is no virtue. Goldwater was nothing if not faithful to his principles. He lost the presidential election to LBJ in a landslide, but he sparked a movement that later saw its fulfillment with the election of Ronald Reagan in 1980. With that, let's dive into the text. Right away, you get into something, in the forward even, that uh, separates conservatism from most of the leftist movements. And the first words of the book, this book's not written with the idea of adding to or improving the conservative philosophy or bringing it up to date. The ancient and tested truths that guide our republic through its early days will do equally well for us. If there's some, if there's one thing you can say is true about conservatism, it, it it's not meant to change with the times, not in its core beliefs. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think, and then Goldwater starting out with that is uh, kind of nailing down one essence of not not just American conservatism, but worldwide conservatism. I'm sure we're gonna have many more opportunities and other from other authors to dive even deeper into that. Mm-hmm. I think you're right. It's a good point. I think the rest of the book is uh, decidedly American, though, especially his focus on liberty. And I think that, you know, he he starts us right off in chapter one, keying in on liberty or what he calls, he labels freedom. I think for Barry Goldwater, the good is inextricably linked to freedom. He says, politics is the art of achieving the maximum amount of freedom for individuals that is consistent with the maintenance of the social order. And also says the day's overriding political challenge is to preserve and extend freedom. So I think that raises the question, you know, what is freedom? I mean, in general, it's the power to act and speak and think without restraint. John Locke said freedom is to live without subjection to the will or authority of any other entity. And I think this is the preoccupation of Barry Goldwater and, and the book. I agree. Yeah. That's um, freedom is that, number one theme that runs throughout the book just but uh, also just juxtaposing that with maintenance of the social order kind of what separates him from anarchists and libertarians and other people who are 
willing to tear down everything in order to increase right. freedom to the maximum. Right, just, right. That's a good point. So he's actually not not the libertarian that I had grown up sort of understanding him to be. Yeah, likewise. So, I, I, I expected more just the way he's presented in in popular culture to the extent he is, is a, a sort of a bomb throwing libertarian. And it's uh, that doesn't really come across in the book. I think that the maintenance of the social order is important, as is freedom. And I think he's trying to draw that the contrast, especially with his own time, the role of senators to preserve and extend freedom. That's in, in contrast. I mean, I think the maybe the view of the good on the left, particularly during his time, but even now, is to contrast that to maximizing welfare mm -hmm. or achieving equality. I mean, he'll say later, and I think we'll get into this, maximizing welfare is not the role of government the role of government or the role of, of political actors. Instead, it's to create op, uh, f freedom and economic opportunity. And I think for Barry Goldwater, economic opportunity is closely tied and almost the same thing for him as, as freedom. Uh, yes. There was something uh, I'm looking for the quote now where you said the freedom and property are inseparable. That really boils down the, the people who try to separate the ideas of economic freedom and political freedom ultimately will be frustrated because if you don't sort of like how uh you see the talk about the growth of the middle class in china you know contrasted with their oppressive system and you know how long can that be sustained because you know in, in every other country it seems when when people grow in economic power they're going to want some of that political power too i think that it jumps out to me too that that for goldwater i mean he gives prominence to the individual and for him freedom is individual freedom, uh, individualism. And again, that would contrast with an opposing viewpoint where more communitarian or egalitarian, where you're trying to, you're trying to maximize welfare and, and ensure that everyone has an equal outcome. And for him, that's almost irrelevant. Uh, right. Right. It's, it's definitely the, the opportunity is his focus, the, uh, the opportunity for freedom and, uh, and economic achievement. If that's, what you're after. Mm -hmm. he, he says the liberal critique is that conservatism is a narrow mechanistic economic theory that may work well as a bookkeeper's guide, but cannot be relied upon as a comprehensive political philosophy. And my question for you is, do you think that still holds true today? And particularly in the context of Trump, it's almost like, I feel like the critique applies more maybe to the wall street journal or sort of Paul Ryan wing of, of, a. Uh, I'm not, I'm not saying it's accurate, but no, I, it, I, I see what you mean. Yeah. That, that sort of a uh, cultural conservatism that's been on the rise these past few years. Isn't something he really writes about. And maybe it's because the dominant culture in his time was fairly conservative, even as the hippie generation was coming up, they were still reacting yeah. against a, a, a basic American conservative culture. Whereas yeah. now I think cultural conservatives feel under siege and that animates many people in the Republican party way more than the economic things. And as you said with Trump, I mean, I think he tapped into that way more than he tapped into limiting government and, uh, maximizing freedom. Yeah, that's a great point. And I think the cultural conservatism, we'll call it social conservatism and, and the religious conservatism, religious right, at least our youth and, you know, up to more or less the present day, but Goldwater and, and multiple times later in his career was pretty harshly critical of the religious right for him expanding and extending preserving freedom he he viewed some of the actions of the religious right as as contracting freedom uh in the in the public sphere because of, because of the desire to sort of legislate virtue and and morality and uh, and he was pretty critical of that right i, I remember when, when we were younger in the 90s that was sort of the uh, critique of Republicans generally is trying to le legislate morality. I don't, yeah. I, I'm not sure which party is legislating morality today. Um, maybe both, maybe neither. It depends how you define it, I guess. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's interesting to think about. <laughs> I'm not sure either um, one of them is really trying. But yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Goldwater would definitely, I think, I think, it, and his view goes back to the founders is that, that virtue is a private matter and it's essential for a, a free nation that people be virtuous, but it's not something government can make you do. Extend this a little further. I mean, I think the contemporary Republican party under Trump has moved in a direction of, of populism, as you say, and cultural awakening maybe. And I think even tax reform, the tax bill from 2017 
uh, at least the way it's covered in media is this is something that he that that re- Republicans in Congress, the elite hmm. uh, of the conservative class, pushed through, and isn't necessarily catering to the new Trump coalition. Um, right. Anyway, but I, I I guess that does kind of come back to his um, that point where we started. Liberals and Goldwater Day spoke of their philosophy as one concerned with you know humanity and culture and people, whereas conservatives were just about dollars. That he turns that on his head, its head is, I think, the biggest. That was the biggest thing that stood out to me when I first read this book is that the idea that conservatives are concerned with the whole man. Yeah. Right. And the idea, yeah, what do you think he means by that? Well, I think in looking at all of the goals from the left were about increasing financial equality, increasing welfare, increasing dependence on the government through that, but all of them had to do with uh, how much is in a man's wallet. Yeah. For Goldwater, it's like, that's not the most important thing in life. It's, it's obviously we all have to be concerned about money. I mean, we all have to work, we all have to provide, but there are other things, including, and he would say freedom should be on par or even above just a simple pursuit of money. And when the more socialistic elements of the left reduce what they call freedom to, you know, just dollars and cents, they're not, they're the ones who are not really looking after the whole person. And I mm-hmm. think, and conservatism, well, it's sort of like that, um, that what's the matter with Kansas argument where you see when people vote Republican who folks on the left think shouldn't vote Republican. They say, well, look, they're against their own interests. Where I think someone like Goldwater would say they know their own interests. Their interests aren't just money. Right. No, that's an excellent point. That's an excellent point. And I think democratic campaigns, I mean, have, have, they've, they've focused their attacks on, on that material side and saying, yeah, you should you should vote your pocketbook, and if you're not, then you must be duped or fooled in some other way. You must uh, be distracted. Like the Republicans have found a way to distract you and move you in, uh, away from your true interests, which in their minds is material satisfaction. But yeah, there's a strong sense from Goldwater: material satisfaction does not equal happiness. Probably part of it, but but there are there are other goods that are more important, right? I, I, or just as important, at least. I th- I think that's one of the main things we should take away from from his book here is that there's there's more to life than money, and that and I guess that's not how people often thought of conservatism then or now. What what are these additional aspects to to the human being uh, beyond the material? He says conservatism looks upon the enhancement of man's spiritual nature as the primary concern of political philosophy. Now, I think that I found that really interesting. I'm not sure that he really developed that you know the spiritual nature. No, uh, I think se. I think you're right. It didn't. It wasn't totally fleshed out. Mm-hmm. As he didn't want to uh, suggest that there was only one way to achieve that spiritual nature. I almost took took his point to mean something broader than faith and religion, but sort of the whole person, the the personal wants, desires, family, tradition. In fact, he says he does dive into tradition, calls it a, a familiarity with the accumulated wisdom and experience of history. He contrasts that with the liberal approach, which is, I mean, in its, in its extreme, you have the Jacobin re- approach of social experiments where we can, we can erase the chalkboard and start from square one. And he says, no, I mean, there basically is a tradition has value and the reason, uh, I mean, tradition is nothing if not the conventional wisdom or the gathered accumulated wisdom over centuries and that has value and and it also has you know lessons for all of us and it's it's also a reason to approach uh, the new and the different with caution that doesn't mean to reject it but but social experiments wild uh, radical social experiments should be viewed warily yeah i think that's an important point i, I think the idea of tradition is one we're going to come across again and again in these podcasts because yeah. there's something about conservatism that respects tradition, but then we have to ask ourselves, well, why? You know, just because it's here doesn't necessarily mean it's right. And I think he just, he explains fairly well why it should at least be given some deference. Uh, this, the accum- mm-hmm. that, that phrase, the accumulated wisdom and experience of history, that's maybe we shouldn't be quick to overthrow everything our ancestors learned and condensed and passed on to us. They might, yeah. they might know something. Right. That, right. That's, that, he explains that, that very well, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think you're right. Well, I look forward to diving deeper into that, and you know Burke and Nisbet and some of those other guys. But 
Uh, but on the subject of whole man, I just wanted to also say, again, it sort of highlights his his preference and his the promise he gives to the individual. You know, you have the individual liberty to pursue your own good. And the whole man is sort of stepping back and saying, yeah, material interests might be your core concern, but it might not be. And, and allotting for freedom, what we're going to say is you have the room to just pursue your own, wh- whatever you view as the good and whatever you view as as uh, happiness and the best pursuits in your own life. And we're not going to tell you, the government's not going to tell you, and collectively we're not going to force you and compel you into one direction. Instead, we're going to give you the freedom to say, hey, this is what I view as my best route to happiness. Or That's whatever. a great point. That, that definitely distinguishes it from almost any other philosophy of government. So maybe one final point on that. He says, man's political freedom is illusory. He says, economic and spiritual aspects of human nature are inextricably intertwined, something that you touched on, and then goes on to say, man's political freedom is illusory if he's dependent for his economic needs on the state. And that's almost self-evident to me, but mm-hmm. others obviously disagree, but you're kind of like, yeah, I mean, if you if you have a deep reliance or fear of the state, then how much freedom do you actually have? And Right. I mean, it's it, if, if somebody else is putting the roof over your head, you're more of a child than a man. And that's that, that it's self-evident to me too. And it always, that kind of baffles me that people don't make that connection more readily. And I mean, I think that that's been kind of a, the conservative critique of liberals, even in our day and age, which is basically like the democratic party is a coalition of, of interests, you know, as George will calls it, uh, itches that the government's there to scratch <laughs> the more reliant you become, you know, how much freedom do you actually have to push back? All right. You have any other thoughts on, uh, on chapter one. No, I think that's, I think we've covered it. You want to move on to chapter two and constitutional government? Cool. Yeah. Kick us off. Sure. This is um, where he kind of focuses in on our American system and what it, how it preserves freedom and why it is essential that we continue to do it. The idea we have, we have kind of sort of a unique constitution and it's meant to, it's a system of restraints. He called it against the natural tendency of government to expand in the direction of absolutism. That's sort that's the sort of, theme that goes back to, I mean, you see it in, in the Federalist Papers, um, that the founders themselves were saying, this is, we, we broke up our power for a reason because we know, you know, there's a famous line, if men were angels, no government would be necessary. We, we know that even if your first president is going to be George Washington, who knows who the fifth president, the 10th president, the 20th president, eventually somebody's going to be up to no good because that's just right. the nature of man. And so we have a constitution that there were freedoms at the heart of it, you know, and um, it's more than just a scheme of government. It's really, it's a scheme of preserving liberty. Mm-hmm. And it goes into that quite a bit in chapter two. Yeah. And it's kind of the genius of the founders is to put constraints on power. It's almost as if they, they approached this from the strategic point of, you know, every faction and every person, every entity is going to grab more and want more. And what we're going to do is pit everyone pit each of those interests against each other and make it more difficult. Now that does make it more difficult. And, and today we almost see the kind of the downside of that yes. structure because we have, a, we have a Congress that we have a Congress that is basically frozen in gridlock. And in the meantime, you have an administrative state that just kind of runs roughshod. And I don't know, what do you think God, Goldwater would say about the current administrative state, the state of executive power? I mean, I, I think he'd be just shocked at the, the cowardice of his fellow congressmen. That's the one thing the founders didn't anticipate is that any group of people who get into government would be anxious to give away power. It took a while for that flaw to emerge in the Constitution, but it is a little bit of fun because you don't expect somebody to be that pusillanimous and just... I mean, you, ex- you expect powerful people to grab power, and that's usually true. Maybe that's the influence of tradition on the founders of them looking back at mm-hmm. other governments and saying, look, this happens every time. We should set up something that turns that on itself. And I don't think Goldwater would have imagined, though maybe he was starting to see it even then, uh, the extent to which people just give away the most, the, I mean, people in the most powerful branch would just give away power. And that's, I don't know. What do you, what do you think? No, so I think you're exactly right because in this day and age, even when you, even when Congress is able to pass major leg- legislation, which is extremely difficult, I mean, in a, I mean, you're basically talking about the first two years of a presidential administration or something. You know, Obama had Obamacare and Dodd Frank and 
Trump has uh, tax reform. Uh, but even major le- legislation, you know, 90% of the actual lawmaking will happen at the administrative level because the legislation, I mean, con- the congressional text is almost a, you know, a guidepost and a, kind of a roadmap, but there's endless numbers of details that have to be filled in by the administrator state. And I think you're exactly right. It's a, it's a capitulation. The founders probably would not have foreseen that, that a Congress would be more interested. And there, and there are actual reasons for this. It's not just, I mean, I think, you know, you highlight cowardice and certainly that's part of it, but I'd also say uh, the difficulty of legislating details anymore. I mean, maybe, maybe it used to be easy, easier at this point. It's, nigh impossible to, to legislate at a granular, granular level, particularly in big legislation. But then there's also political reasons because, you know, there's a, there's a a desire and kind of an ease in passing the buck and saying, well, this is, this little piece, that's going to be messy. And I just as soon push it along and then we can point fingers and blame the administration for how they implement. I think that's a big part of it. I think it's easier to make the broad speech and do the fundraising and all that. And then if the actual execution gets messed up, well, that's, you know, that's somebody else's fault. And then maybe, maybe it's just that we're, we're legislating about things. We're legislating details of people's lives and businesses that we didn't use to. I mean, it's an, that's true. it might be inevitable that it's going to be complicated like that. And you're going to need the, the bookshelf full of regulations just because we're, we're getting so interfering into each person's life. Whereas, you know, yeah. it was easier to pass laws, but we didn't uh, control that much. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I think to the critics who would say, oh, well, how do you, how does a, how does a government operate without, without delegating, you know, a large amount, a large amount of the power to the executive? I think he has an answer to that that you and I will get into in just a minute, but that's devolution to the states. Yes. I mean, allowing democracy to thrive in different directions, you know, at the local and state level, but we should, we should hold that for just a second. I wanted to also say it's, it's not only liberals who have uh, held this desire to expand government and, and, and concentrate power. There has certainly been a strain of conservatism and, and particularly the neoconservatism where expanding executive power has been a, a front burner goal and objective for, for neocons. It's even more particular for foreign policy, but even here at home, I mean, a desire for a strong executive for co- the flow of commerce, let's say, mm-hmm. and make, making it easier for companies to operate with, with uh, preemption. And, and, and I think we see the downside of that because at least in my view, um, some of the trade policies coming out of the administration, I mean, that's unilateral. That's all, all authority that's been delegated to the president, to the administrative state. And there's nothing the Congress can do to slow it down or stop it, really. I mean, even passing legislation would require a presidential signature, which presumably he's not going to give. It, it's crazy uh, that the, they, they gave away that much power over something that used to be, I mean, in the, in the late 19th century, that was half of every con- con- half of every congressional session was tariffs, you know? So yeah. was, this was their whole thing. And then at some point they decided that it was just too much, too complicated, too politically, you know, problematic. Well, and historically, I mean, you have a you have an executive who wants to expand free trade, right? Who wants to push push out the outer limits. And again, this I think that this goes to sort of what I was getting at with neoconservatives. I mean, there's there is justifiable reason to say, hey, let's let's give more power, more authority to the president, because you know, as long as Congress is running shotgun and on trade, you know, we're gonna we're gonna continually trip up over parochial interests. Versus, we give this power to the executive, and he she can get out there and start signing deals. And then now we're seeing what the flip side is. <laughs> he can also go back and torch uh, current deals or, you know, ensure that we don't have any future deals. We run into uh, the kind of thing that we often tell the left is that, you know, don't give this power to somebody because eventually your, your opponents are going to be in power. And then we, that's exactly what we did with trade or with free trade. Yeah. So just one final thought on that. I'd say, you know, the problem becomes even more acute with Supreme Court has, you know, Chevron deference, how so much authority has been passed to the to the executive branch, not just from Congress, but also from the court mm-hmm. to say, basically, 
we're going to, we're going to view this hands off. If they think it's a good idea, as long as it's even marginally defensible, then sure, we'll, we'll call that good. And so there really is no check and balance right now, I think, on so many areas of the administrative state. That's, that's a, that's a good point. And I, I think they did it kind of for the same reason as that the, the rules they were analyzing were so complicated and so specific to a certain subject area that I think the court, the courts were honestly worried that they'd mess it up because they don't know, you know, the fine details of, you know, water rights in this thing or, you know, admiralty or what, whatever is being regulated. But yeah, then mm-hmm. you end up with a situation where there's, it's just a runaway administrative state. So let's, let's talk about what Goldwater labels what he lists out as the legitimate government powers, because he says the role of government is to remain limited to what he calls legitimate government powers. And he, he enumerates these, he says, maintaining internal order, keeping foreign foes at bay, administering justice and removing obstacles to the free interchange of goods. What do you think of that list? I mean, it's, those are all legitimate aims of government. Um, most people would add a few, but that's, that's yeah. That, that really that that those at least you can't argue with. Um, but yeah, so I, I'd agree. But I think that maybe the difficulty though is how 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 do we define subjective terms? Mm-hmm. Because I think I think liberals would say administering justice. Yeah, that's exactly what we're doing. We're right. You know, I think it begs the question a little bit to say administering justice. Um, yeah, I think he's probably thinking of you know contracts cases in federal court. Whereas, yeah, justice can that that can cover a lot of things. Yeah, and and similarly with uh, keeping internal order, mm-hmm. um, does that is that limited to sort of police the you know FBI and I mean I think others may may disagree. I think you're right about how he views those definitions because he even says later, you know, government's role is not to solve problems, and I, I think this is the fundamental difference between the left and the right you know, over time, certainly in our lifetime. And that is Democrats, people on the left fundamentally view the government as a tool to solve problems. We, we've identified problems in the world and our duty is to solve them collectively, where I think certainly Goldwater, many conservatives would say, no, that is not the role of government. Government is not problem solver. Instead, you know, there are multiple levels in society that should focus on that. Yeah, I, I think you I think you you've got it there. That that makes sense. Maybe that's part of the uh the critique of conservatism from the left is that it's a well, if you're not solving problems, what are you doing? But yeah, right. Yeah. Good point. Yeah, if you if you're not solving problems, then really your only focus is on the grab bag, the gimme 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 of uh making money and 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 uh hoarding power. All right. Yeah. And so then in the, in the, in the chapter, he also reemphasizes the the role of government is to exercise powers to allow citizens to follow their own pursuits with maximum freedom. So he keeps hitting on that, that same or theme, theme of freedom. And, and he, he has this line in the book that, you know, that I cheer, but of course may be viewed as maybe a little radical, but he says the first duty of public officials is to divest themselves of the power they have been given. And yeah, that's a, uh... Can't imagine that actually happening. I've heard people say that when they run for office. It usually doesn't pan out. But yeah, and where you said my aim is not to pass laws but to repeal them. That's uh, yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's so and good, that's, and that is really that's movement conservatism right there. Yeah, and certainly the and, and I think you're right. Uh, the p- folks have run on it, and I think it was a, an animating factor for the Tea Party for sure. Is to say we need to roll things back, and uh, but. I mean, there are such institutional hurdles, uh, entrenched interest is probably the biggest, but it's always easier to buy favor than to, than to take it away. And I think we saw this with Obamacare repeal. It's very easy to say, I want to eliminate something, but once a benefit has been conferred, you know, just human psychology, it's far more painful to have something taken from you than to have something never given. Once a benefit has been enjoyed or is in the stream of of the collective consciousness, I mean, then it becomes incredibly difficult, almost impossible to roll back, which is the reason basically nothing has been rolled back since the new deal. 
Right. And I, I think that's true even for benefits that are only enjoyed by very few, where you would think most people wouldn't care if they got repealed or would even cheer it. But you need things like the import export bank or some of the provisions of the tax code that benefit keep reappearing in the in the law, even when they almost get repealed. So yeah, there is tremendous inertia. I think that's a good word for it. Yeah. And I think, I think what you, you put your finger on, on one of the main problems too, which is that, you know, in a, in a pluralistic, uh, Republican form of government, very small, narrow interests have sometimes, I mean, the, the founders pit factions against each other and that, that works, but sometimes I think the, uh, the loophole though, is that very narrow, very loud interests can win the day. We'll say, for example, on, on sugar tariffs, uh, sugar quotas. I mean, how in the world uh, does that, do we maintain those? Well, because you have very vocal, politically powerful because they, you know, they fund, dish out a lot of money. Uh, but even more importantly, you have a few states where these interests are located. And once the benefit has been given, you know, it's almost death to a senator to try to vote against, you know, his or her little narrow constituency like that. And so suddenly, even with a, even with a small, narrow benefit, um, it becomes almost harder because granted the kind of the silent majority will say doesn't care that much, maybe thinks it's wasteful, but they don't have the level of vociferous like hate for that's equivalent to the desire on the part of the narrow interest to keep the benefit. So anyway, it becomes, it becomes very difficult because you don't, I think Republicans have taken advantage of this dynamic in the past on judges because you know, set, setting the Kavanaugh episode aside, I think Republicans have been, conservatives have been very successful in filling uh, the judicial bench. I think largely because there's a small group that cares about it so very much. It's the only, almost the only issue that they care about. And as a result, it kind of drives the train. And on the left, they, they haven't had, and possibly that's changing, but they haven't had an equivalent uh, counterbalance to that just small, vocal, very dedicated, you know, group to, to push back. No, it's a good, it's a good point. Uh, maybe, maybe we're seeing that pushback now, but yeah, maybe, maybe that is changing, but that's definitely, I think you're right about how it's, how it's gone so far. All right. So let's get to you. You quoted some of this, uh, it was what I call Goldwater's conservative credo. I'm just going to read it because I think there's so much here and I, and I, and I can't wait to hear what you have to say, but he says, I have little interest in streamlining government or in making it more efficient, for I mean to reduce its size. I do not undertake to promote welfare, for I propose to extend freedom. My aim is not to pass laws, but to repeal them. It is not to inaugurate programs, but to cancel old ones, and here I'm paraphrasing, that have failed in their purpose. I will not attempt to discover whether legislation is needed before I have determined whether it is constitutionally permissible. Now, I think there's some, there's some rich, good, good material here. Yes. Uh, well, I mean, that's, that, it's all inspiring. I mean, the way he says it is nice too, but um, just to take the first point, you see even uh, a lot of Republicans get away from this, uh, especially in state government, when you get a, a businessman running for office, like, like a Romney or somebody who would say, he's going to make government efficient, make it work for you. And that's presented as a conservative idea. But I think Goldwater would say that's just that's just a more efficient leftism, and he, you know. It, right, right. It's a more efficient way to solve problems, which he says that is not the role. The role of government is not to solve problems, and and to your point, like Romney would say, well, we will solve these problems, but we'll do it in a conservative way. Right. <laughs> that's. I think Goldwater would say there is no conservative way unless the government's out of the picture. Right. Conservative right, way right. is for people in your community, your you know your local organizations and churches and whatnot to do it. But yeah, that kind of follows on to the second point is that he's not about not promoting welfare. And that's, I think it's, it's hard, it's hard not to reward your people once you get into office. There's a big temptation there. Well, it just comes across as so heartless, I guess, to say, I do not undertake to promote welfare. Well, like, well, yeah, that's the whole reason we have government, right? I mean, I, I, I heard Kennedy, uh, when I was 12 years old, I, I heard our president, John F. Kennedy say, ask not what you can do for your country, but what you can do. And it inspired me so deeply. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying those aren't inspiring words, but Goldwater would have said, he just would have shrugged at that and been like, okay, but do it on a local level. And, and this, you know, these aren't words to inspire you to, uh, come join the government and, 
ex- explode it in every different direction. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, even in the, the preamble to the constitution, it talks about promoting the general welfare. So that's, I mean, it's, it's not, even the founding fathers nodded at it in a way that Goldwater doesn't. Yeah, that's a good point. So it's, point. I think he goes even a little farther than they would, or maybe because they didn't anticipate how far things would have gotten out of whack. Yeah, it sounds heartless, but it, I, I don't think it is, but it certainly sounds that way. Well, and and, and I, you know, to me as a as a former Senate staffer, his his line that says, you know, his aim is not to inaugurate programs but to cancel old ones. I think the public doesn't really realize that almost everything that that Congress does pass anymore is just layering on authorities that the administration already has all these trade all this you know trade delegation has happened you know 40 years ago really and it just keeps getting layered on and and uh you know we ran into this with um some of the authorities at the department of energy particularly with regard to uh, energy efficiency the department of energy already had all the authority that ever needed to do what basically whatever it ever wanted because it's not actually changing the landscape at all mm-hmm. Uh, people and people actually don't realize that, but that's a good point. Um, and I, I really I don't remember the last time we canceled a significant program. I'm trying to think, uh, they seem to hang around, yeah. even when they have failed in their purpose. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the best you can hope for is is it just gets ignored. Yeah, but not that it's changed at all or, or removed. That's kind of that's kind of crazy because you can't you can't say with a straight face every government program works, and and yet none of them yeah. can get canceled yeah. though. All right, should we hit uh, chapter three? Yeah, let's do it. So this is the, the chapter on states' rights. What does he say about states' rights? Well, he, he, he gets into, and it's sort of the, the second layer of dividing, of separation of powers in our government is that instead of, that not only is there the three branches at the federal level, but we prevent the accumulation of power in a central government by reserving most of the power to that in their state capitals. Mm-hmm. And then that's implicit in the constitution and it's also made even more explicit in the 10th amendment because even back then people didn't trust that there wouldn't people in congress wouldn't find a way around some of the article one and article two restrictions so they uh that that 10th amendment is there that recognizes the states have primacy where the constitution is silent yeah why don't you tell us what is the 10th amendment let me get the so so while you're looking that up i'm going to say a couple chapters ago when we're talking about What's his antidote? If the government, if the federal government's role is limited, then how do some of these other issues be taken mm-hmm. up? And his antidote to all that is is states' rights, pushing things down to the local level. And he says, essentially, local problems are best dealt with by the people most directly concerned. And I think intuitively, I think we all agree on any end of the spectrum. I, I want to stipulate too that I think I think that federalism can be used just as just as powerfully. Uh, by the left as it can by the right. Oh, I, I agree. I'm I'm surprised it hasn't been more in the past couple of years just because. Yeah. We, we have a good example right now of California privacy law and they've, they've gotten way out ahead um, on privacy legislation. They've, they've gotten way out, ahead, way out ahead on some of the climate change stuff. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I think those are perfect examples. States rights and, and federalism doesn't mean uh, Jim Crow. Certainly not anymore. Right. Now, here's, here's the 10th amendment. It, it's, the power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. Just one sentence, but it really sums up federalism pretty explicitly. And so why, why do you think it's been completely ignored? I mean, the 10th Amendment, I mean, uh, of, of the ten, uh, you know, of the, the, the Bill of Rights, the, the 10th Amendment stands out as the one amendment that the court has completely ignored, that has been you know, basically gutted all efficacy. There was, um, I think there was a case Darby versus the United States in the forties where the court just basically said it's a, it's a tautology or it it doesn't, doesn't really mean anything. That's, that's a heck of a thing to say about one of the 10 parts of the bill of rights, maybe because it's, because it is so broad that it just seems more like a general idea if you want to look at it that way. But I don't, I don't know. Um, I remember, when Bob Dole was running for president, he, he talked a lot about the ninth and 10th amendments and people kind of acted like he was a little nuts for it, you know, cause it was pretty, it was outside the mainstream even in those days. Since then, I think Republicans have embraced it more. And, uh, as you said, the left is starting to understand that devolving power to the States can work for them too. I'm continually surprised when they call for more federal power. 
knowing that their opponent is in charge. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me. <laughs> right. You know? No, that's 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 exactly right. And I think um I think we have a, a key example right now, and that is kind of some of the movement, n- not of all Democrats, but certainly some elements uh, on in their coalition to m- move to an open borders model <laughs> of America, or, but to eliminate ICE. But the, the but the so so uh, shut down ICE movement. I mean, what they really mean to say is we don't like how ICE operates under this president, <laughs> and I think that's an example. You know, maybe actually maybe that's an issue that that deserves preemption and, and wouldn't fit in a in, in federalism uh, model. But still, I mean, the point is when the other side is in charge, then many of these, you know, programs or, or agencies that we love suddenly become our enemy. And then it's, you know, four years later, it flips. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the, the focus on that too is it kind of shows the the diminution of the, the legislative branch. Is that they, they want to abolish ICE, not reform the immigration laws. But it's it's like it's like when conservatives say abolish the IRS. It's like, well, there's still taxes. Yeah, you know, <laughs> right. Somebody's going to make you pay them, and the same thing. If somebody's going to enforce immigration laws, so it'll just be a different group. It's weird that they don't. Maybe because it's easier to say abolish ICE than say make these changes to immigration law, because that would have to be kind of specific, and you'd have to think about it, and there'd be conflicting interests. But I guess as a rallying cry, ab- abolish this, abolish that is maybe maybe simpler. Well, so I'm glad you said that because I think, you know, to be fair, that's an argument. What, what other arguments are there against the idea of local control? I mean, I think that, I think, I think liberals would say, well, local control creates, creates real losers because in that's, in that way, you know, the majority really is going to dominate a minority and you're going to have inequality, you know, it'll create inequality, let's say in school funding from district to district, from neighborhood to neighborhood, rich neighborhoods. So you'll have great schools and, and equipment in one district, but then basically, uh, you know, a school that's falling apart. So it creates unequal results. Yeah, I guess that's the best argument against it. Um, I mean, there are some things that are probably even... What would Goldwater say, do you think? Well, I think, you know, I think he said it. that's not the job of the federal government is to, is not to achieve equal results. Um, uh, I mean, I think there are, there are definitely some things that are incapable of local control, like the military. Well, I mean, I guess you have national guard stuff. That's kind of local, but you know, uh, borders, we really can't, I guess you could have California run its own borders and Texas run its own, but it (laughs) seems like, Oh, that would be really interesting. I don't think it could work. But yeah, I think the other things, it's mostly about they don't like the local results. And, that, you know, they think, yeah, you know, like you said, it's going to create real losers if the government in, you know, Montgomery or Atlanta does it. But it's not if the government in Washington does it. And I don't, I don't know why that is, but that seems to be the prevailing idea. Yeah, so I think you put your finger on it because I, I don't want to discount that sort of concern that the unequal, uh, unequal funding of schools, mm-hmm. let's say, for example. And so we need a federal role and, and maybe Goldwater would say pushing it up to the, to the federal level is not going to solve that problem either. You have a better chance of getting the problem solved maybe at the state level. And if, you know, maybe school funding is an area where uh, a redistribution is, is called for, but let's do it through, pro- you know, do it through property tax or do it, do it in a way that's closer to the people. Yeah, I, th- I think that's right. So and I, th- I think, I think at this point, where the 10th amendment has been ignored and basically gutted, uh, these fights, at least at the judicial level, I think occur along the lines of the commerce clause. Most recently in the ACA decision, even though the chief justice, uh, ruled in favor of upholding the ACA, there, there was a a minor victory for, for the cause of federalism and, and the commerce clause with, uh, you know, because they, they ruled that federal government couldn't mandate the Medicare expansion or medic sorry, Medicaid expansion. Yeah, that was kind of surprising yeah. because they had been doing that sort of thing where we'll give you money, but you have to do it our way. And then, you know, they've been mm-hmm. doing that for a, quite a long time. So that, that was kind of a hidden bonus from what was otherwise yeah. not a great decision for us. Well, and it's interesting how it's played out because there have been several states who, who have continued to, to hold out. And there have been others who held out originally, and then once it became clear that Obamacare would never be repealed, they started moving in the direction. I think I live in Virginia, and I think Virginia is on the cusp of uh, accepting uh, the Medicaid expansion. But and, and that's a purple state. But you even have red states, let's say like Utah, who are moving in that direction also. 
but you know, at the very least you have the experiments happening, you know, at the state level and letting people see, e- even though you're talking about, you know, federal funding, massive amounts of money. That's true. It's a, at least the administration is local. Okay. So we've covered the first three chapters and I think, again, there's just rich in very thought provoking material. We wanted to get to chapters seven and eight and, uh, and probably 10 to talk about the communism and Goldwater's views. I think we're going to get to that next week. Kyle, do you have any closing thoughts for the first three chapters of Conscious of a Conservative? Well, like you said, there's a lot there. I think he lays out some great principles that can, you know, freedom, tradition, social order. And there's a lot a lot to work with if you're trying to understand what is the nature of conservatism, and American conservatism especially. And uh, yeah, looking forward to the next part. Cool. The conservatism that, that Goldwater lays out is, is frankly one that, that speaks to me. I mean, of course, it still it raises the question of how do you respond or how do you react from here? I mean, maybe he would be a little bit more radical than maybe I would in in rolling things back. But I think he he sets forth a very defensible vision of the federal government and and of conservatism. And I'm I'm really glad we read it because for whatever reason I had never read this before. I'd always understood Barry Goldwater to be much more radical and way outside the mainstream. And I guess that is still true. I mean, this this vision of, of conservatism really is maybe a little bit outside the mainstream. It certainly would be running a campaign today, yes. you know, if Barry Goldwater, <laughs> if this was the, the campaign fl- platform, I, I don't know how very far it would go. And we've seen, you know, the Tea Party has carried some of these and, you know, have had they've, they've had much more aggressive tactics, you know, maybe than I would, but we, we've seen how much success they've had, which is almost none. Yeah. So I think what he has here is really thought provoking and interesting. And I understand now clearly well why this has sort of been viewed as the Bible and kind of sets the stage for movement conservatism moving forward. All right, cool. That's the end of our first episode. Uh, I hope we'll catch the, uh, the next episode where we tackle the uh, second half of the book, chapters seven, eight, and 10. All right. Thank you for joining us.